Coming up on this Friday edition of Newsline at Noon, the Korean government holds a special meeting to draw up comprehensive steps to end rampant illegal fishing by Chinese boats. In the ongoing legal fight between the world's two largest smartphone makers, Samsung asked a U.S. appeals court to throw out the $930 million in damages awarded to Apple for patent infringement. Plus, Washington reveals a mission to rescue an American hostage held by al-Qaeda in Yemen. The American was not at the scene of the operation last month, but other hostages were rescued. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Friday, December 5th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh jin -ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, Korea is seeking out ways to take bolder action against illegal Chinese fishing, fishing, which is a huge problem here in Korean waters. Right. The ruling Senate Party and officials from relevant government ministries convened a meeting on the matter this morning to discuss ways to improve countermeasures. An official at the National Assembly says the government has not done enough to protect the domestic fishing industry. Korean fishermen have been calling on the government to strengthen its monitoring and crackdown as Chinese fishing boats have been illegally entering Korea's exclusive economic economic zone in larger numbers. They also want the authorities to widen the scope of their patrols. Hundreds of Chinese fishermen are arrested each year for illegally fishing in Korean waters and often react violently when Coast Guard officers approach their vessels. Washington's top nuclear envoy Sung Kim is meeting with his South Korean counterpart Hwang Jun Guk on this Friday for talks on their respective North Korea policies. Now, during their meeting, the two envoys talked about the six party nuclear talks and ways to denuclearize North Korea. Their talks followed North Korean leader Kim Jong un's special envoy Choi Ryong hye's visit to Russia last month. Their chair reportedly told Russia that Pyongyang is ready to resume the talks on his nuclear program without preconditions. Next week, Kim will travel to Japan and China, both participants of the Stall Six Party talks, to discuss the North Korean issue. President Pekin has said that the reunification of the two Koreas would be a bonanza for the Korean Peninsula. Well, not everyone in South Korea might have such strong convictions like the president, but still seven out of ten South Koreans say they support the idea of a unified Korea. Kim Min-ji tells us more. Unification of the two Koreas would be a bonanza. Words spoken by the South Korean president. But what do the average South Koreans think? Believe it or not, seven in ten people say we need unification. This according to a survey by the Seoul-based Korea Institute for National Unification on 1,000 people nationwide. Then why do they think unification is needed? Nearly 40 percent of respondents said it was because North and South Koreans belong to the same race. Eliminating the threat of war came in second, followed by reuniting families separated by the Korean War and becoming an advanced nation. While not many South Koreans see unification as a benefit to themselves as an individual, they believe that it would be a boon for the country as a whole. If and when the two Koreas do become one, the respondents said their top agenda should be working to achieve greater economic growth. Experts say the GDP of a unified Korea could reach 70,000 U.S. dollars by 2050, the second highest among G20 nations. While the report shows public sentiment is largely behind unification, many South Koreans were still apprehensive when it came to the idea of moving to the North for work or marriage, indicating there is still a way to go before they feel totally comfortable about their northern neighbors. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. 
If and when the two Koreas become one again, it's expected to set off a mass migration of North Koreans coming south. So just how many? Well, according to experts who gathered at the first Korea-Germany unification policy seminar in Seoul on Thursday, the number is roughly 1.8 million, which is about 7.6 percent of the current North Korean population. In the case of Germany, following its reunification in 1990, over 400,000 East German immigrated west, which was about 2.5 percent of the East German population. Participants at the event, which was co-hosted by the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy and a German Institute for Economic Research, agreed that South Korea needed to begin putting policies and programs in place now to prepare. South Korea will mark the fifth anniversary of the fatal sinking of the Chunan warship next March. Now, the vessel, which was torpedoed by North Korea, was recently moved to a park to be displayed for educational purposes. Chu Sun reports. Inside a park at the South Korean Navy Second Fleet headquarters south of Seoul now stands what remains of the Chunan warship, which was torpedoed by North Korea nearly five years ago. A $6 million project has placed the 1,200-ton vessel here from a nearby dock to show the very appearance of the Chunan cut into two pieces after the attack on March 26, 2010, which claimed the lives of 46 South Korean sailors. Visitors can get a wider view of the area atop a four-story high observatory and listen to the details of the tragedy before paying tribute to the sailors in front of a monument. The exhibition will become a sign of protecting our country, where a will for a victorious fight will be imprinted in the officers, and people will be reminded about the value of security. In a bid to turn the painful memory into an opportunity to educate people about security, officials plan to build an additional memorial hall next year. I was heartbroken when we had to say goodbye to our children, but I'm thankful that the government has made efforts not to forget them. Some 830-thousand Koreans and foreigners have visited the Chunan since it was displayed at the fleet's dock soon after the attack. Now the story of the ill-fated vessel can be told to more visitors at its new home. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. And in other news, Korean police are in the process of establishing a special division to tackle sexual abuse and harassment in the wake of a string of high-profile cases involving some of the nation's most influential professors and public officials. Connie Lee has more. It could be seen as a new push in the fight against sexual abuse here in Korea. The National Police Agency has announced that starting next year, a special division will be set up solely dedicated to investigating sexual abuse cases. The agency says it wants to reduce the number of cases here in the nation and to strengthen investigations into victims' reports. This announcement comes amid a recent string of sexual abuse and harassment cases involving socially influential men. Just this past Wednesday, a professor at Seoul National University was detained on charges of sexually harassing his intern. A professor at Korea University, another prestigious school, recently resigned after accusations he sexually abused his student. A former prosecutor general is also under the spotlight for allegedly molesting a female employee at a country club. These are a small sample of the powerful and influential men that have been accused of sexually harassing women. The cases could also be the tip of the iceberg, as many incidents are believed to go unreported. These are men with power and authority, so it's not easy for female victims to stand up against them. The National Police Agency's latest plan shows its efforts to combat sexual abuse. Earlier this year, the agency set up a special task force in well over 100 regions throughout Korea to investigate sexual abuse cases. Connie Lee, Arirang News. The Japanese yen has dropped to a new low, dropping to the psychologically relevant, important 120 mark against the greenback for the first time in more than seven years. The yen tumbled to as low as 120.25 before pulling back a little to close to 119.78 in New York 
On Thursday, the Japanese currency has been on a downward spiral for months now, particularly since the Bank of Japan announced new stimulus measures to try and boost the Japanese economy in October. So far this year, the yen has fallen over 13% against the greenback. The yen also fell 0.7% against the euro on Thursday. 930 million US dollars. That's the eye-watering amount of money Samsung Electronics was ordered by a US court to pay Apple for copyright infringement. But Samsung is now fighting back and it's trying to get the fine reversed. Shin Se-min reports. Samsung Electronics wants a U.S. appeals court to throw out an earlier court's order that it pay Apple 930 million U.S. dollars for infringing on iPhone patents when it made its Galaxy range of smart devices. Stressing the design and the look of the company's devices are different from iPhones, Samsung's lawyer Caitlin Sullivan said the damages award was excessive and unwarranted. Making the Korean company's case at the U.S. District Court in California on Thursday, Sullivan said the lower court was wrong to decide Apple's design patents were infringed upon because the Samsung devices do not carry an Apple logo, do not have a home button, and the speaker spots are in different places. She said it was absurd to make Samsung pay Apple its total profit for the Galaxy devices, likening it to giving back the entire profits on a car just because it infringed another automaker's cup holder. Apple's attorney, William Lee, dismissed Samsung's argument and said the $930 million award was fair. Reports say the three judges did not indicate when they would reach their decision. The massive award to Apple is the largest set in any of the so-called smartphone wars. The patent lawsuit between Apple and Samsung began back in 2007 and has rumbled on for years. Samsung and Apple agreed in the summer to drop their patent litigation outside of the U.S., though they have yet to settle their broader dispute. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, with Korea's heavy dependence on exports, the government has long stressed the importance of foreign direct investment. Free economic zones, as they're known, are dotted around the country to try and entice foreign companies to lay some roots down here. But Korea is having to raise its game quite a lot, given the amount of competition throughout the region. Our Song ji reports. To attract more foreign direct investment, Korea has established eight free economic zones over the past dozen years, with their total area amounting to 330 square kilometers, or half the size of Singapore. This one in Incheon was the first to be set up in 2003 and is the biggest of the eight. Foreign investors can receive tax exemptions and incentives when setting up their businesses in these free economic zones. BMW is one of many enjoying the benefits since building its first driving center in Asia at Incheon. It took years to choose the location through multiple feasibility tests, and we are fully satisfied with our decision. It's close to the capital and the metropolitan area. It's close to the airport, which enables us to provide maintenance service when our clients fly out. Korea seeks to become the center of East Asia in terms of investment by attracting more FDI in the eight free economic zones. But further deregulation is needed to fight rising competition within the region, as China and Taiwan also launched similar free trade zones last year. Uh, FDI coming into Korea, if you go back to 2003, it's gone up by about a factor of three. So it's good progress, um, roughly on a par with other countries in Asia, but good, uh, solid progress. The competition is there, though. I mean, I think that's key. Korea is not alone in doing this. The researcher also points out that inefficiencies in labor and financial markets are slowing things down, while Korea's infrastructure and high level of education stand out as advantages compared to its global competitors. Song ji Arirang News. Starting in the new year, Swedish furniture giant IKEA will stop selling a world map which refers to the body of water between Korea and Japan only by the Japanese name. Ahead of the opening of its first store in Korea this month, IKEA says it decided to leave the map off its product lineup. 
The map, which caused quite a stir here in Korea, refers to the sea as Sea of Japan, which you can see in the video there. But it doesn't use the Korean name East Sea. Explaining the map was not intended to be used as an educational tool. The company has apologized for upsetting its customers and employees. Well, it's time now to get a check on the global headlines. We're following this hour. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by the News Center. Eunice, mostly peaceful protests are going in the U.S. over the latest grand jury decision in New York City not to press charges against a white police officer who killed an unarmed black man in a chokehold. I understand uh, plans are already underway to retrain the city's police force. Right, Jinju, we're of course talking about the NYPD, the largest police force in the country. There aren't a lot of details yet on this program, but New York's mayor, Bill de Blasio, iterated on Thursday that policing has to change. He said he understood the anger and frustration exploding onto the streets. People need to know that black lives and brown lives matter as much as white lives what we still have to aspire to. Police Commissioner William J. Bratton outlined some of the detail. He said a three-day program will start this month, during which some 22-thousand officers will undergo teaching on street tactics, such as presenting a non-judgmental posture, in addition to the usual firearms training. Now, earlier from Washington, President Barack Obama had said too many Americans feel deep unfairness when it comes to the gap between professed ideals and how laws are applied on a day-to-day -day basis. But a New York City police union told reporters 29-year-old officer Daniel Pantaleo had acted properly in restraining Eric Garner on July 17th. Officer Pantaleo had testified he meant no harm when putting Garner, who had health issues, in a chokehold. Shifting to the Middle East now, al-Qaeda's affiliate in Yemen has threatened to kill an American hostage by the end of the week if their demands are not met. The group gave Washington three days to meet its demands, which were not disclosed. Sun Jung-in has more. In a three-minute video posted by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula on Thursday, the terror group's leader threatened to kill an American hostage, claiming the U.S. had committed crimes against the Muslim world. Nasser bin Ali Alansi gave the U.S. three days to meet unspecified demands that he said Washington was aware of. We give the American government a time frame of three days from the issuance of this statement to meet our demands, about which they are aware. Otherwise, the American hostage held by us will meet his inevitable fate. Soon after the statement, Luke Summers, a British-born American, appears in the footage pleading for the U.S. government to save his life. The 33-year-old photojournalist was kidnapped last September in the Yemeni capital Sana'a while working for the Yemen Times. My name is Luke Summers. It's now been well over a year since I was kidnapped in Sana'a. Basically, I'm looking for any help that can get me out of this situation. I'm certain that my life is in danger. The threat comes more than a week after a rescue attempt by the United States Yemeni mission freed eight hostages kidnapped by al-Qaeda's Yemen branch. During the joint operation, however, the military is known to have failed to locate other five hostages, including Mr. Summers. Sun Jung-in, Arirang News. And finally, Russia is having a difficult year, says President Vladimir Putin, and he urged his citizens to brace themselves for another difficult year ahead. In his annual address from the Kremlin, the Russian leader characterized the pressures from the West to another mode to restrain the state and likened it to Adolf Hitler's failed invasion of Russia in 1941. During the 70-minute speech, President Putin also defended his decision to annex Ukraine's Crimea this spring, calling it a sacred site to Russians as is Temple Mount to Jews or Muslims. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. 
connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ajin Ju. Even when I'm Ajin Ju, marketing researcher, strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics. Now, space represents the final frontier for the human race, but man, space flights have been few and far between in recent years, particularly in the United States. Well, NASA had plans to launch its first spacecraft in more than a generation this week, but technical problems have delayed them. Kim Jian has the details. The launch of the Orion space capsule from Cape Canaveral in the U.S. state of Florida was called off just four minutes before scheduled takeoff due to technical problems. They were detected in the batteries of the rocket's camera and the balls of the shuttle's water supply. A spokesperson for NASA told AFP that it tried for several hours to fix the problems, but were unable to, forcing the launch to be postponed until Friday morning. The launch of Orion is highly anticipated by the space community. It would mark the first time in more than 40 years that NASA has launched a craft designed to carry astronauts deep into space. Orion is planned to fly an altitude of 5,800 kilometers, circle the Earth's orbit two times in four and a half hours, and land near waters of Baja, California, west of Mexico. Through the test run, NASA will carry out a number of measurements that will be crucial in scheduling a manned space flight in the future. A crowd of 26,000 people gathered at the Kennedy Space Center to watch the Orion launch and left disappointed about the delay, but they will get another shot to see history again in the coming hours. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Well, back here on Earth and uh, global temperatures are rising, it's sad to say, and while we may not be able to feel the difference that much in temperature, we are seeing the changes reflected in a growing number of superstorms that leave destruction and devastated lives in their wake. So what can be done to try and mitigate the impact of climate change? It's the central question that is being asked at a uh, UN climate meeting in Peru. Guansua reports. November 2013, Typhoon Haiyan slams into the Philippines, killing more than 6,000 people and turning the lives of millions of others upside down. Now, another super typhoon is bringing back memories of last year's nightmare. Typhoon Ruby is forecast to make landfall within the next two days. It's superstorms like Ruby that are sounding alarm bells worldwide about the effects of climate change. It is a major topic of conversation at UN climate negotiations in Peru. When we were in Doha, it was Typhoon Bhopal. When we were in Warsaw, it was Typhoon Haiyan. And now that we are here in Lima, we are facing Typhoon Ruby, which is also a category four um, super typhoon. We need you to get your acts together to meaningfully respond to the urgency of climate action. Many experts agree that global warming intensifies extreme weather events. The World Meteorological Organization reports that 2014 is on track to be the hottest year on record. To mitigate further damage, the international community is making a renewed push to reduce carbon emissions, with extra pressure being exerted on the globe's two worst polluters, China and the United States. Secretary General Pan Ki-moon welcomed the new pledges from Beijing and Washington, as well as another out of Germany, to cut emissions. Next year is an opportunity to take big steps, transformative steps, in the right direction. We must do all it takes to provide hope for people and the planet. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. It's a cold afternoon here in Seoul and all across the nation. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. Currently, cold wave alert have been issued in Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, and on Chungcheongbuk-do provinces.
where there is strong wind blowing here in Seoul. And as you can see that it's much, much colder today than yesterday just by looking at the temperatures. The current temperature stands at minus 9.8 degrees here in capital. However, the wind chill is at around negative 14 degrees, which is a lot, lot colder than it seems. So make sure to bundle up when you're heading outside today. Now, the snow that was coming down on Chungcheongdo and Jeolla, the provinces, will clear up finally by tomorrow morning. But it looks like our freezing cold temperatures will be sticking around for a weekend, too. And to our readings for today, so it will peak to minus 3 degrees this afternoon. We the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will top to 2 and 5 degrees. And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops to 6, while Tokyo hits 1, while Nankungan will be topping low at minus 10 degrees. Well, that's all for now. Michelle Park now. Here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. Well, those are the stories we are following at this hour. Have a great weekend. Mark and I will be back at the same time on Monday. Until then, goodbye.